Hey, maestro, anytime. Hit me. Ah, you long. Friday night, every other Friday night, you know what we do? We come a crawling up your leg. Stick our snoot right up your skirt. <laughs> My name's Norman. I'm the Wop at the Bop. The Guinea with the skinny. The Guido and Speedo. The last true man. The heart and soul. The undisputed, undefeated, uncrowned king of Pittsburgh rock and roll. I didn't ask to be the uncrowned king. The title fell upon me. <laughs> and now I just try to live up to it. Hey, um, I hope y'all had a better week than I did. My week was a pain in my aching ass. You hear me now? Jeez! I fell apart this week. I got sick on Monday. Now my left hand don't work. My shoulder aches. But you know what we're going to do, me and Tom? We're going to do what they call man up. I ain't slept. Don't, I'm gonna, I, better, I better step back a few feet before you can see the years on my sagging face bag. Because I swear to God, I looked at myself in the mirror when I left the house. I looked at my lady. I said, hey, toots, do I look as bad as I look? You know what that bitch said? She went like this here. <laughs> That's what we got. Hey, I'm lucky we get along. I was talking to my buddy in Jersey. I says, how's everything going out there? He says, oh my God. He said, every guy I know says to me, when I kill my old lady, you know, stick up for me. You know, come to see me when I go to jail because me and her can't stand each other and we can't get away from each other. But my buddy said, he says, I don't have that problem. He says, I got nobody. He says, I wish I had someone that I could not get along with. So... I'm lucky. Me and my old lady, uh, we actually enjoy one another. Who'd have figured, right? Who, who would have figured someone would be able to stand being around this mass of insanity on a daily basis? You know what it takes to be able to do that? Hillbilly innocence and hillbilly beauty. I love every goddamn thing about it. Hit me now! <laughs> to get down when we get down to the get down everybody gonna lose their blues when we get down to the get down bring your dancing shoes gonna get unwound to get down Everybody knows that they get down. Ain't no room but to get down. Play it cool. What goes round comes round. Let's get down here. When we get down to the get down, everybody coming out to play. When we get down to the get down. Gonna swing and sway 
to the soulful sound of the get down. Friday evening, here we are hanging out together. I'm so glad to be with you. My nose is running. I'm looking for something to blow my snout. Give me one second, I'm gonna run over here. At the get down. Well, well, well. There we go. Nardini, permission to blow snout snur. Snur. Sir. <laughs> Blowing snout, boss. <laughs> Remember when the movie Cool Hand Luke? How great of a picture that was? I got a buddy named his son Luke. And I think it was after uh, Paul Newman's character in that movie. How cool was Cool Hand Luke? You know, us... Uh, crazy people we need role models too and we would look for role models like like cool hand Luke was like uh, Jack Nicholson was in uh, one flew over to cuckoo's nest like those characters to guys to misfits and edge of society type people we look to those folks for leadership and, and for uh, an endorsement if hey if they can be that goofball so can I. And uh, so Cool Hand Luke lives on in a lot of 60 to 80 year old men. He's inside our hearts and inside our souls. And you know what he's doing? He's just doing shit to piss off the man. Because the man needs pissed off. Because the man, you know what I think of the man? Because the man ain't the man. He has the power of the man. But when but the who the man is Cool Hand Luke. The man is Jack Nicholson and one flew over the cuckoo's nest. The guy that stands up to the man is the man. That's what I'm thinking. Hey, uh, welcome to Norman Nardini Alone Eight. You know, I've had a lot of folks, uh, a lot of friends, say to me, uh, "When are you gonna bring somebody in? When are you gonna bring in Harry? <coughs> bring in a singer? Bring in a couple of musicians?" And I hear it loud and clear. But uh, the way things are going with uh, the situation in our country, it almost seems like a good idea that I haven't uh, brought in others to help support and, uh, and to help entertain you guys. And not, it's not that I want to deprive you of other people's talents. It's that it just doesn't seem like the smartest idea at this time. And it also, this also gives me a chance to swim upstream. You know what I'm saying? To stand in front of you, or sit in front of you, and work you. This old slab of a face working you, loving you from in here. And you know, this week, like I say, with my hand hurt, my shoulder hurt, my gut hurt, not sleeping, my face hurting, I know it's killing you. I'm feeling you guys more than I normally feel you because I need. Something that I haven't had in months and months and months. You know what I'm talking about? The, the thing that happens whenever you... There, there's a show going on in New York. There's usually a little guy running out on the edge of the stage. If they're filming it especially. And he holds up at a sign and the sign says, Applause. He goes, and everybody in the audience applauds. Whether they want to applaud or not. Because they're a part of the show. Well, we don't have that here. If you don't want to applaud, you don't have to applaud me. And if you did, I wouldn't hear it anyway. But I might feel it. And that's what I need to feel today. Because it'll lift me up and give me wings. <laughs> Look at that little dago got wings. What's that? What's a, what's a dago bird that has wings? I don't know. We'll have to think of a good joke for that uh, question. I'm going to hit you with a... One of my oldest Norman songs, just to get us kicked off here. I'm going to bring up my little Mexican Martin. You guys might not know this, but I sn snuck this in over over the, <laughs> over the border um, before the wall came up. And uh, I just got in right under the... I got it in right uh, against everyone's wishes. And now we're working together. The Mexican Martin. 
given to be my, given to me by my friend Jay Flores, who was the original road manager for the House Rockers, and who was an amazingly great guy. And back in the day, I used to um, book those guys on shows when I had the diamonds. And when I had the diamonds, we called them uh, Pittsburgh Rock and Roll shows. It was the diamonds and the house rockers. And then when I had the tigers, I would book them on shows as well. And Jay used to say to me, he said, dude, when we would go on the road together and do like weird cities in Pennsylvania or Ohio or big cities like Pittsburgh and Cleveland, he'd say we would stay in the same uh, hotel, you know, motels. And he'd say on one side of the parking lot would be the house rockers rooms. And on the other side would be the diamonds or the tigers rooms. And he said, all of the house rockers would sit in their rooms and crack the window, move the curtain just enough so they could look out the window to watch what was going on in your guys' rooms. And he says, and all night long, there was dopers and whores and freaks and weirdos sneaking in and out of your rooms all night long. And in their, on their side of the room, they were all just trying to figure out how to eat up a bowl of soup their mother sent with them. He says, you guys was living rock and roll. Those guys was watching it from a little crack behind the curtain. How you doing? And you know what? If that ain't the truth, y'all can kiss my... And if that ain't country, who said that? Johnny Paycheck? He might have been the first to say it. Maybe not, though. Wrote this... Uh, I don't even know if I wrote it. I just started singing it and... And people seem to like it. <clears throat> Are you ready? Ready, Freddy? Are you ready? Ready, Freddy? Tell me what are you waiting for? She got you look down right out of sight, out of control. Are you ready? Ready, Freddy? Go tired to see your baby. She all steady. Dead and Freddy, brother, I don't mean maybe. She girl's looking alright, it's out of sight, out of control. Then you get her in the back seat, lip service, and you're moving on down the road. You pull into a side street, give her a header. Gotta get up, you gotta go, man, go. Oh, are you ready? Ready, Freddy? Go up town and rock and roll. Are you ready? Ready, Freddy? I'll tell you what are you waiting for. She got you looked down right and it's out of sight, out of control. Your girl's looking all right and it's a Saturday night. Out of control. Out of control. Out of control. Out of control.
That's from back in 1979. I think we scratched those words together at 78. I think I wrote it when I was still in the Diamonds, which would have been 78, beginning of 79. Hope you guys are enjoying the summer. Hope, it, hope this isn't a bummer summer and that everybody can find a way to make the most of what it is. Because what it is, it's our reality, it's today. We can't rub up against one another like we like to do at the Pule, at the movie theater, at the Pirate Games. Does anybody miss baseball as much as I do? I mean, when I was a little kid, my father used to take us to the ball games. And we used to sit in the left field bleachers. They called it the Knothole Club. And my uncle Riley, my my father's mother's brother, they used to call him Barrels because he was short, thick little Italian, and he loved he his favorite thing in the world was pork chops. He would like to eat pork chops for breakfast. And they gave him a little pistol. I think there were two bullets in it. And he put it on his side here. And he, he wore it. He was like a security guy at Forbes Field. And we used to hang there. And I, I'm so thankful that my dad took us to those games. Because I got a chance to see the classic time of, uh, at least from, from my lifetime, of uh, Major League Baseball. I got to see the Chicago Cubs, Ernie Banks. Feel so good today, let's play too. Remember that? Ernie Banks. Who was that picture they had? Ferguson Jenkins got to watch him pitch. The San, I, I remember a, a twinite doubleheader with San Francisco, Juan Marichal, Orlando Cepeda, watching these gentlemen play ball. Willie Effin Mays. Are you kidding me? Seen him work. How about Stan Usual? Seen him work. How about Joe and Phil Negro, who were from right across the river from, uh, from Wheeling, West Virginia. I think they were from Bridgeport, Ohio. Those two brothers uh, uh, had quite careers in a, They were with the Milwaukee, Milwaukee Braves. Hank, Hammer and Hank. We used to always say, when we think of Hank Williams, play a Hank Williams song, we always say, give Hank a yank. But how about Hank Williams? He'd give that ball a yank, right? Bang, 44. Crack it out of the park. He was quite a guy. Eddie Matthews played third base. Got to see all those guys. I remember one game when our Bucks were playing the Los Angeles Dodgers. And on the Dodgers team was Don Drysdale, Sandy Koufax, and Larry Sherry. And the visitor's bullpen was right underneath the left field bleachers, which was on the sideline, facing like across the field. And, and those pitchers were all hanging there in the bullpen. And me, as a 12, 13-year-old little boy, I mean, you can't imagine this to be true, but I was a, quite a show-off as a little kid. I loved attention, and I loved talking stupid. Kind of reminds you of what's happening <laughs> right now, right? But... Uh, and I remember entertaining those three pitchers. They weren't all there for the whole time, but they were in and out, and uh, and they would all point to me from their buddies, and and because I was you know putting on a little show for them, and they would laugh at me, the little kid. But now, as I look back all these years later, how lucky I was to uh, just be there, this part of American history, you know. But in my mind, the two greatest times in American history that interests me the most as a, what, what would I call myself as it? Old beatnik. The two most exciting times in America for me would have been the Negro League Baseball. To me, if I could have hung out anywhere on a Saturday afternoon, I would have liked to have been in a Negro League game. And a few years back, when my mother was um, in the care home in the last few months of her life, there was a woman in the same care home that I used to see every day. And we got to talk and got to know each other. She was, she was in her 90s at the time. And her name was Mary Knox. And her brother, Elmer Knox, 
was one of the business league officials of the Negro Leagues. And I used to talk to Mary Knox, and she'd talk about Satchel Paige and uh, how cool that was, you know. And to me, that's just like, like uh, such an exciting time of American culture and American history. I'm fascinated by it. And besides the fact that my mother's father, Elpidio, used to hang out, really did hang out at Negro League games. And what he did was play co cheat cards. He was a cheat. And he would also play the shell game where you put a marble under one of the shells and he would cheat at that too. And that's how he made a living was by like con artist. He would look for, uh, he was like my old buddy, Racetrack Mike. He was always look for weak minds and weak people and then he would take advantage of them and get what he could. And then he would bully them around because he was a short, stocky little Italian. Another time of American history that fascinates me is... American jazz in like the 60s and 50s when uh, Miles Davis, John Coltrane, Eric Dolphy, these uh, jazz pioneers, and they were, they were playing a kind of jazz before uh, fusion came along. I kind of lost interest in, in all that when fusion came around in right around 1970. But the jazz before that and in the 50s, the Blue Note stuff, Kenny Burrell, all those kinds of... Something about that fascinated me. I just thought that was such a cool part of our culture. And, and I know worldwide there was a fascination with it, just like there's always been a fascination around the world of American soul music. Um, but uh, I don't know. I just thought that'd be something to yak about a little bit. If there's any fans of uh, Negro League Baseball, shout it out! Josh Gibson, right? You kidding me? You know who Babe Ruth was? He was the white Josh Gibson. How do you like that kind of talk? <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, I'm going to do something today. I'm going to play a couple numbers that I haven't played on here before. And one of the first songs I want to play is a song I wrote for my friend Ronald. Moondog Effer. The man in the Moondog. The man who owns Moondogs, the Starlight, put together the Pittsburgh Blues Festival for all those years, 20 some years. He used to have me run the uh, Pittsburgh All Stars, Blues All Stars, for many, many years. Well, I was talking to a buddy of mine in Moondogs named Chuckles the Clown. Him and, him and Nipples the Clown, uh, I think, did a short stint at, uh, in prison a few years back. But anyway, uh, Chuckles and I were talking about Moondog, and I was talking about how crazy he was and all the goofy shit he was saying, and Chucky said to me, he says, Moondog, he's crazy as a shit house rat. And as soon as he said that, something snapped my girdle, and I says, you know what? That sounds like something that could lead me to a fun song. And so I put together a, a little number that I'd like to play for you all <laughs> at this moment. And I'll send it out to Chucky e. Kohler, alias Chuckles the Clown, and his lovely wife Sandy, whose wedding I played at, by the way. Uh, and I'd like to send it out to Ronald Moondog Esser. And if there's anyone out there right now that's watching that knows Moondog or can get in touch, he's probably at the Starlight right now. Making fish sandwiches and sparogies. <laughs> Let him know that I'm doing Shithouse Rat in his honor. And the last verse of this song is specifically about Moondog. All the other verses in the song are about the hypocrisy of our great, wonderful nation, of which I'm not disparaging for a moment. I'm just uh, having fun with. But uh, see what you think of this piece of crap. Little thing called Shit House Rat. <laughs> I turned on my TV All these shows about reality It ain't real You can be sure about that 
make you crazy like a shit house rat. Get the more paper at the corner store. Every word and read and I read before, cause it ain't nothing new. Try printing that. Make you crazy like a shit house rat. Shit house rat. Shit house rat. Every mother's sons and daughters drinks that same old shit house water. Now everybody craves like a shit house rat. I tuned in talk radio A self-righteous man putting on a show Gave me half the truth Said that's the facts Make you crazy Like a shit house rat Now Father John and Pastor Joe Say if you want to get to heaven Gotta share your dose So they heal the sick Then they pass the hat Make you crazy Like a shit house rat Sing it with me Shit house rat, shit house rat. Every mother's sons and daughters drinks that same old shit house water. Now everybody craving like a shit house rat. So I keep lapping it up, and laughing it off, watching everybody slopping in the same trough. Hey, my weather man, he's a ride on the money. Said the winter's coming on, but it's bright and sun, and I'm a walking around in my winter coat and hat. Make it crazy, like a shit house rat. Here comes Moon Dogs first. You ready? I got a friend spend money like a whore. He got two of everything, but he still wants more. We got a three-legged goat and a one-eyed cat, and they're all crazy. Just like a shit house rat, sing it. Shit house rat, shit house rat. Every mother's sons and daughters drinks that same old shit house water. Now everybody craving like a shit house rat. You might think you're different, but don't go falling for that. Nowadays everybody craving like a shit house rat. Shit house, shit house, shit house. Red Mooney to the Moon Dog to the wonderful, wonderful Ronnie Moon Dog Essa. We sent a lot to him. I'm sure he's got some pierogi on his breath at the moment as we speak here today. Um, here's something I wanted to talk about that I, that I think people weren't doing like they used to do. You know, these changing times. Young boys aren't what young boys used to be. My age, young boys used to stick out their thumb, run away from home, like, you know, Tom Sawyer, you know. I mean, I, I wasn't quite that old. But uh, we used to play wiffle ball in the streets. My old lady's brother used to play kick the can out in the country in West Virginia. You know, um, we used to stay out as long as we could until the street lights come on. And then we could, we wouldn't have to come in, but we'd just have to be close to the house so she, my mother could, if she called our name, we could answer her back. Because we were out of the house and we were active, we were doing things. And uh, I, I was starting to study music by the time I was 11 or 12. I actually started when I was a little kid. But I started studying seriously around 11 or 12, so I'd be at rehearsals or at gigs or always trying to uh, get take biting life on the ass and getting light, get pulling the energy of life into myself. It, it seems that things have changed and, and young boys aren't as active and as uh, daring and as courageous and, and they aren't seeking you know, a higher level of life the same way we did. I'm not saying that the, the young guys aren't uh, getting a lot out of life. It's just they're doing it differently than we did. And that uh, worries me so much so that the other day I was uh, with my niece, a couple of nieces and, and their friends and younger people. And I said, said to my niece, I said, uh, hey, um, you know, did you ever light farts? You know, uh, 
or you know, the boys, your brothers ever like farts, you know, around the house just for laughs and get things going. And they looked at me and they says, no, is that possible? I says, you mean you're telling me you've never seen someone light a fart? And they're like, no, she, I, I heard about it. I heard people have done that. And I says, people have done it? I says, how about me? Like, I ain't done it? I says, you look at this face. This is the face of an old fart lighter. No question. If I could get a laugh, I was going to do it. So here's the scenario. I think I'm in eighth grade. And me and two of my musician eighth grade or ninth grade friends, bass player, Mike Connell, really cool bass player, still alive today, lives down in the Carolinas. Guy Perry, very cool guitar player, lives in Florida. Um, we were all in junior high and we were staying over at Mike Connell's house for the night. I, they called it a sleepover, now they call it a sleepover, whatever. So we're all over there and we're just up laughing and goofing. About four o'clock in the morning, we'll sit up and Michael's, Mike Connell's father, whose name was Fagin the Viper, he was in bed. So we're down in the, on the living room floor, you know, rolling around being little boys. And I start lighting farts because it's real dark. We shut out all the lights and then I blast them out. Whoosh, get some nice concussion and get some nice foot and a half length, you know, blue smoke. <laughs> and all the lights are out. It's totally dark. And we're all sitting there, all being real quiet until the fart comes and the flame. And then we all <laughs> laugh under our breath. So I hit one, bang, it shoots out. And as soon as, it, as soon as we all start laughing, the lights come on. And Mike Connell's father, Fagin the Viper, is standing and he goes, Very nice, Norman. That was very nice. And uh, he busted me with a flame shooting out my giggy hole. How cool was that? But my niece and her generation, they, they had heard of farts being lit, but they didn't live the reality of it. And, I, and for some reason that stuck in my mind and I says, well, isn't it a shame that uh, the fart lighting tradition of little boys hasn't carried on into the new generation of uh, boys that play computer games and boys that move their thumbs real good. Uh, it's a new world. I don't understand that world, but uh, I come to, you know where I come from? The world of fart lighters and guys that thumb across the country. Guys that got thrown in jail for no good goddamn reason. That's who we were! And hey, uh, I wish the best for the new young people. And I'm sure they're doing some things that I don't understand and I wouldn't know anything about. Uh, let's play a song. Let me stick something in your ear. Okay. I'm going to send this song out to my friend on the West Coast. James Dog Dealey, who used to live in my closet in New Jersey when we had our apartment out there. We took him in. He was, a, he was one of the only tall Irish people. You know, Tom, they don't make a lot of tall Irish people. You know that. Um, but he was like a 6'2", 6'3", 6'4", and handsome. He was so handsome. Still is. And he kind of looked like uh, the cowboy actor, Doug McClure. Remember Doug McClure from the Big Valley? My friend, and, and women used to like Dilly until they found out <laughs> how cool he was. <laughs> they, left, they found out how cool he was. They didn't like him so much anymore. <laughs> but uh, we're still buddies. And uh, I always, he always talks to me about this song. When are you going to do it? When, you, when did you cut it? Is it on an album? And uh, I haven't done that yet. But uh, I'm going to play it for you now. And it's a story song. I think we've done it on the Norman Alone series where we just talk the words. And uh, it's just four verses and it's about uh, somebody and somebody is how it's worded in the song. When you hear somebody and some, somebody is one of two people and the two stars of the song are somebody and somebody. When you hear someone, that's not one of them and that's a, an outside influence. <laughs> And it, this is a song about um, cheating and not being able to deal with cheating in a um, 
realistic fashion. The song's called Blues Come Blowing In. And uh, it's a really fun song to play with a band because it has uh, a great rhythm track to it and uh, great chance for bass players to funk it up. And uh, great for guitar leads and for saxophone leads and all that stuff. And uh, let's see what we can do with it here. I've got a bad, bad feeling Somebody gonna cry Somebody cheated Somebody lied And someone told somebody What somebody did Somebody hurt somebody And the blues Come blowing in Blues come blowing in I've got a bad, bad feeling The hurt is gonna last Somebody's got issues Somebody can't get past Then somebody shot somebody Now somebody's dead Somebody got arrested And the blues come blowing in Blues come blowing in I've got a bad feeling Somebody ain't gonna fry Someone reads a verdict Somebody's fixing to die Now someone's serving somebody Somebody's last dinner Somebody's checking out And the blues Come blowing in Blues come blowing in You get when you're dealing with the pain in your heart I've got a bad, bad feeling But ain't nobody left to cry Somebody were murdered Somebody fried now someone say on somebody, ah, somebody. I screwed up the last verse. I'm going to try it again. I got a bad feeling. Ain't nobody left to cry. Somebody was murdered. Somebody fried. Now someone's burying somebody. And somebody chin to chin. The tools don't say somebody hurt somebody. And the blues come blowing in Blues come blowing in Sorry about screwing up that last verse. I hadn't performed that one this way, you know, ever actually. So I was, uh... hey, what are you gonna do? But I didn't want to get that last verse me uh, screwed up in your mind. I wanted you to remember what it was because what it is is I've got a bad, bad feeling. Ain't nobody left to cry. Somebody was murdered. Somebody fried. Now someone's burying somebody and somebody chin to chin. And the tombstone says, somebody hurt somebody. And the blues come blowing in. You kidding me? Get over here! That's killer. How do you forget something that cool? You know the only way you do it? Is if, if you're an old, saggy bag of meat like this. And you had a bad week like I did. Oh, the other thing I didn't tell you about my bad week. Wednesday night... 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, my goddamn water heater blew up. Oh, my. Oh. All right. That's enough. You don't need to hear any more about that.
But that was another part of uh, the week that was. Tom, how are you feeling today? I'm feeling all right. How's everything in Erie, Pencil Tuck? Just fine. I love it. You know, uh, makes me think, I don't know if you knew uh, Mayor Joe Sinnott from Erie. Did you know Joe? Yeah. Did you know him personally? No. Uh, I got a chance to know him. You know who introduced me to him and helped me and him become very good personal friends? Who's that? Moondog. Moondog. Moon yeah. Because they did shows together and uh, and we ended up golfing together. This is what Erie's like. Joe Sinnott's grandfather and my grandmother were buds back in the day. How cool was that, right? Yeah. Joe's a really good guy. And we would golf together. With Moondog, we do these uh, sporting oh, and music God. golf events. And so uh, this is going to lead me to this. Uh, I don't picture you as a golfer, Norm. I, I'm more comedy relief on the golf course. They use me out there for gags. In fact, I created a thing that I do when, when I, uh, when I golf. At the end of every time I golf, I have a ceremony that now is starting to become a tradition that people seem to want to call to me, call me in to do because no one's ever done it before. I'm a pioneer in the golfing industry. And what I do at the end of every golf tournament that I'm involved in, I have a ceremony, and Moondog calls it the blowing of the kisses. And what that means is Moondog straps me into the back of the cart. Puts like I'm like a bag, and he straps me in. And he drives, and we go around to anybody that's still out on the course. And we drive up. You know how you're not supposed to make noise on the golf course? Well, we drive up, and Moondog goes, Hey! And everybody turns around, and when they turn around to look at the person yelling, I stand in the back of the golf cart, and I blow kisses. And then Moondog drives away real fast as I'm blowing kisses. And then we go, we find more people when I blow kisses to them. And it's catching on. And I, I think pretty soon, one day you're going to see Tiger Woods in the back of a golf cart blowing kisses. If not, um, maybe he'll hire someone to do it, and he'll just drive the cart. That's what I'm thinking. But anyway, getting back to Joe Sinnott. <laughs> and this will lead us to some other things that I wanted to talk about. A couple years back, Joe had us and the Shondells play a show right outside the mayor's office, which is at the top of a real nice building in downtown area. And that's where that little concert space is. You know where that is, Tom? Where, right in Joe's office, you look out the office and you look down upon the whole scene. It's fantastic. So before the show, we all set up and did our sound checks. We had like an hour and a half before I had to go on. So Joe calls me and the Shondells up to his office to hang out. So we go up to his office. So, and when we get there, Joe has one of his secretaries bring each one of us a personal present wrapped very nicely. And he says, go ahead, guys, open them up. So we open up our presents, and they were for each of us. It was all the same present. It was a uh, a beautifully, I think they called it pewter metal, hand tooled, and it had Joe's name and had the city of Erie, and the the logo of the city, which I forget what it is. That sentence is, but uh, and as soon as I opened mine and I saw that everyone else had theirs open, I says I says Hey guys, I says check it out. I says. I said, this, thing, this is a great joint rolling tray. And the other guys were like, oh, dude. Like they thought I shouldn't have said that in front of the mayor. You know what I mean? But meanwhile, I knew the mayor. And I knew that uh, he knew me. And he wasn't going to get mad about it. He was going to go, that's Norm. He's a goofball. But uh, the guys from the Shondells, Ron, uh, really good guys, Mike Vale. Uh, they thought it was just a hilarious moment in time, which I did too. But anyway, one of the reasons I wanted to mention that is I just did a, an interview this week for my friend Pags. He wanted to do uh, a story on me, uh, marijuana and music, and the song Smoke Two Joints. So if you get a chance, you can find it on my Facebook page. Look up, you'll see uh, there's a picture of me and a bunch of smoke kind of like a Snoop Dogg kind of pose. Uh, I did an interview with Pags. It's not a video. It's it's just a, it's kind of like a radio interview. 
and uh, if check it out if you get a chance. It's pretty cool. Um, I think you'd like it. What else did I want to tell you about? There was another story that I had thought that related to that. Oh, here's another one. Uh, I was at a Bon Jovi show backstage, hanging out with, with the guys, and the show was over. And um, me and David, the keyboard player, were always guys that would burn together. And when we get the chance to see each other, in a ceremonious kind of way, that's how guys like us would always operate. And this time, um, they had Bobby Bandiera, a legendary uh, New Jersey guitar player, singer, with the band. Uh, he was a side man, you know, doing background vocals and playing the extra guitar parts behind Richie. And um, David said, come on, I'm going to turn you on to something I got just got from New York. So we went around backstage at the arena, it was at the Civic Arena, and we uh, went into the Penn's locker room. <laughs> and we smoked a joint in the, in the Pittsburgh Penguins locker room. And I just thought that was such a cool story for people to hear. You know, I don't know if it may, puts me in a bad light or whatever. I don't think it does. I think it just tells you what, how people are. But I, I always thought, and, you know, I, I says, hey, guys, I says, you know, I'll rem remember this the rest of my life. Here's the, the three of us. And my, I think my buddy um, Al Benz might have been with us, too, the four of us. And we smoked a joint in the Penn's locker room. How cool that was, right? It's not a weird thing. It's not a, anything to be ashamed of. I think it's like, it's what's up. You know, it's like you, it's one of those things you remember for a long effing time just because it happened and you happen to be a part of it, right? Am I goofy? Well, yeah. Um, I bet you nobody has smoked joints in both the Penn's locker room and Morris Levy's office at Buddha Records. Tom, <laughs> I'm so glad you pointed that out. See, Do let you me have a third instance? <laughs> <laughs> let me tell these people who they're looking at. This guy that you're looking at right now smoked a joint in the Pittsburgh Penguins locker room, smoked a joint in legendary music gangsters Morris Levy's office. That's who you're looking at. I ain't just nobody. I probably do have a third, and, and, and it would come to me if I, if I spent enough time thinking about it. Uh, there's no question I have a third one that's just as amazing because I have been around quite a while. And I've been like I am for quite a while. So, um, yeah. Um, let's do another song. I was thinking about this piece of music. I wrote this years ago, and it's a story song. And um, I had played it for a while when I was playing with me, Whitey, and Harry, that, that configuration of the band that lasted a good, I think, about 20 years. And we happened to end up be turning that little three-piece into a very formidable little act. Did a ton of gigs. We were doing three and four gigs a week for years and years and years. And life just went on. And we just went from gig to gig to gig. What a great way to live, right? Um, but I wrote this song as, as a story song. When I started getting into characters and creating um, scenarios that people might be able to relate to and attach it to their lives. And um, that's what this thing is. It's called uh, Two Story House. And I, I, I'm going to play it for you. And the other thing about this song that is extra cool is this song... It's one of the only bisexual songs that I've ever played. And when I say bisexual, I say that to mean it's in two different time signatures. The song is written in 4-4 four, four time, but there's a segment of the song that goes into 3-4 time, which is waltz time, which is the most romantic time known to man. And... Um, and it, it goes back seamlessly from 4-4 four, four time to 3-4 time throughout the song. And I just say it's bisexual because it's something to say it catches people's attention. But, and maybe it puts a smile on their face. But that's, um, 
what it is. And um, I wanted to um, put that into this song because it isn't something I've heard a, a lot of writers try to pull off. But I think um, on this number, I, it came off, pulled off pretty well. A little thing called Two Story House. And I haven't, like I say, I haven't had time, like I screwed up my last song. Uh, I hope I don't screw this one up. But I just didn't have enough time to work this week because I was all effed up. See what you think. She wasn't the prettiest girl at the party. She wouldn't stand out in a crowd. He cleaned up good, did the best that he could, but it was plain to see he was wild. He asked her to dance to a slow song. She said yes, but she didn't know why. Soft music played, two strangers swayed, and they both held on for dear life. Then that slow dance turned into an evening, and that evening turned into a life. In a two-story house in the country Where they live as husband and wife Got themselves a two-story house Started taking and giving How they're in that two-story house Ain't doing nothing but living They weren't a match made in heaven, but they found heaven in a two-story house. Different as can be, but they both had a need. And time has a way of sorting things out. And lately she's been looking better than she ever did before. And he's walking proud after the child that they both adore. Cause that slow dance turned into an evening And that evening turned into a life In a two-story house in the country Where they live as husband and wife Got themselves a two-story house Started taking him, giving him out there in that two-story house Ain't doing nothing but living Two stories of love's lost glory Came together in a two-story house Two lonely hearts won't ever be alone Cause this two-story house is a home In a two-story house in a two-story house Got themselves a two-story house Cause that slow dance turned into an evening And that evening turned into a life I don't know Two-story house Couple of folks like that one, sometimes I say it's a couple of losers find each other and they got themselves a little trailer out on the edge of town where they're hutching like a couple of monkeys. <laughs> but uh, that's a nice piece of music to uh, solo on. And uh, whenever you open that up with a band, boy, it's can be fun to... Uh, and transitioning from three time, three quarter time to four four time, all that stuff when you're doing it with, when you got to have some guys that are tuned into what you're doing musically, and uh, guys that can handle arrangements and uh, things that are, aren't just typical bang 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 boom boom. You have to have some cats that have some musicality in their shorts. You know what I'm saying? Not all guys that play have the sensitivity to handle the depth of certain hunks of music. Like the one before that too, Blues Come Blowing In. You, you want to get with some cats that uh, 
sense and feel those uh, those repetitive changes. Be, you know, sometimes when, when you don't have a lot of actual chord changes, the way you handle that is the way you address how you make the same chords over and over again sound different at different parts of the songs. So, so the, the costumes that everybody's wearing while you're, you know, playing these performances gives the musicians a chance to show what they know about musicianship. And it's cool when you can play with cats that, you know, they can interpret the shit. You know, when you get some guys that are light on their feet but still got some pop. You know what I mean? That's what you need. When you want to be a good player and you want to play with the best cats, you need guys that have some power but have some sensitivity sensitivity, and they get light on their feet like a boxer. You know what I mean? They're light on their feet. But they got power! And that's like being a good musician. That's what that comes to. You have that lightness and that power. And that gives you what I would call all the colors of the rainbow or all the tools in the box. So when you start taking these different pieces of music and dressing them up and uh, presenting them, now when you have these the, the right musicians helping you accomplish that, now you can create world-class band and world-class music that people can just sit and, you know, um, and let the music overpower them. You know, like when we were kids in the end of the 1960s, we were little boys, teenage boys. We used to buy the record on a Monday or Tuesday over at the record hut right on Noble Street here in Swissville. Me and the bead man, our friend Moon, not Moon Dog, but we had another friend named Moon whose father's name was Moon. And we would buy our, the albums that we wanted and we would wait till Friday night to listen to it. We'd buy it on Tuesday, but wouldn't even open it till Friday night. Then we'd go to the bead man's house and we'd get down in the basement. We'd shut out all the lights. And we'd put on that record and we wouldn't speak until that record was over. We'd all just lay there on the floor and listen to every note of every instrument and every word of every song. And this was us going to school. You know, yeah, we went to school. Our bodies were physically at, you know, Churchill High School or Swissville High School in the daytime. And, but our minds weren't as deeply involved in that as it was when we would shut the, we'd put, listen to the first Traffic album. We listened to uh, the Beatles' White Album, you know, uh, these records. And they would, uh, we would, it'd be like jumping in a, in a shower. And out of the shower wasn't coming water, it was just coming words and music and rhythm, melody and rhyme and time, and it would just wash over your body. And when you let your mind feel all that, it was like a cleansing of your soul. It douched out all the things in the world you didn't understand as a teenage boy. There was a whole lot of shit I didn't understand and still don't understand. But when I'm, but when it, when it comes to dealing with music, there's a whole lot of things I do understand. The problem with music is this, especially in today's world. A lot of people that make music don't know what they don't know. They know what their, their um, limited experiences. Most of the people that are making music today didn't spend hour after hour on stage watching people's faces, watching people's bodies, and try to take strangers and convert them into songs of characters and melodies and and uh, situations that you're creating, they didn't, they just do it in some studio. And in that studio, all they're getting is support and pats on the back from other guys and women that uh, want to believe that what they're doing is physically capable of moving people and physically capable of... Uh, taking up someone's mind and washing it clean. The way to find that out isn't to do it in a studio. The way to find out if the, if, if the way you're writing and, and, and what you're saying is moving people is to do it in front of people. 
So, you know, a lot of times I say, well, I can't listen to music today. And really for the past 30 years, 20 at least, is because the people that are making music are the people that are best at running computers. And what the hell does that have to do with making music? If music is made for people, does, don't people have to be involved in that process somehow? And, and if the way that they would be involved would be to be in the audience and to be the object of the music, you would want to have always include the experience of running this music down on people so their faces and their body movements tell you if what you're doing has meaning and has significance. So, I don't know. I, I guess it takes a guy as old as me to say something like that. Because I remember when music people weren't computer people. They were people people. The music people were the, were the people that had the balls in their pants to go out and live the life. They moved out of their homes and lived some strange place and hung out, met new people and uh, learned new things and, and forced life upon themselves as opposed to, you know, buying this machine that uh, you push all these buttons and then the music comes out of it and happens. And hey, maybe there's people that, that really understand that kind of thing and really get feeling from it. I just don't happen to be one of them for whatever in the hell that's worth. Hey, uh, we're glad to be here. I wanted to talk about uh, something that happened years ago. When I had the record out, uh, This Old Train on Larry Germack's circumstantial label, Larry got us over into Germany and we did a tour with the Blues Brothers. And at the time, uh, the two lead singers were uh, Eddie Floyd, who was the wrote and sang uh, "Knock on Wood," and another cat from West, from uh, St. Louis, and I, Larry something. I can't remember his last name. They were the singers, but the band was the regular band. And the trumpet player was Mr. Wonderful. His name was Alan Rubin. Do you remember him, Tom? Yeah. Did you ever meet him? No. Uh, I got a chance to hang out with him. Not so much on that tour, but um, later I, I remember hanging out with him. And we were doing, um, I don't know if I just went up to hang out or I was on the show in Cleveland at that B.B. King Club. And we were hanging out backstage, Alan Rubin and myself. And he's since passed on. But he was talking to me about how he uh, didn't really like playing trumpet with the Blues Brothers. And I says, oh, really? I says, How, why, why don't you like it? He says, he says, this music isn't written for trumpet. He says, I studied classical trumpet my whole life. He said, I go, blah, 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 blah. He said, There's, he said, it just isn't what I listen to. He said, this is the kind of music I listen to and this is, isn't the kind of music I study. I just fell into this gig. And so we were talking and really nice guy. And then he said to me, he says, he says well, what kind of music do you like? And I said, well, I said, it sounds really crazy, <clears throat> but at the time, I was playing in a rock band, but I was listening to almost exclusively country music. I said, I really enjoy listening to country music. That's what I study now. The songwriters and the melodies and the chord structures, oh, from Steve Earle all the way up to pop country at the time, which had some really great records. The country was great uh, through the 80s and 90s. And... Uh, he says, oh, that's crazy. He says, uh, he says, you know, my first wife was a country singer. I says, you serious? He says, yeah. And I said, what was her name? He said, her name is K.T. Oslin. And I got this big smile on my face. I said, are you serious? I says, you were married to her. He says, yeah. He says, why? Have you heard of her? I says, well, yeah. I says, um, we have her records. I says, and me and my wife we're big fans of her records and sometimes whenever uh, the two of us are together and we're listening to music and it's one of them evenings KT Oz's music is some of the music we put on to heat up dinner if you know what I'm saying 
You know, she had a song called the uh, Hold Me a Little Tighter. Tell me tomorrow be brighter. Kill it's good. I think the name of the song was Hold Me. And uh we play it all the time. And he said, Are you serious? I says, Yeah, I says, We love her music. And he said, Yeah, he says, Yeah, she dumped me. I says, Cool. And he was smiling, he wasn't mad at me. He says, Hey, no, he's no big he says, Hey, me and her stayed friends through the whole thing. He says, we're, he says, we're still friends. He says, I says, I says, why do you think she dumped you? He said, um, she went the other way. And I says, well, what are you going to do? And he said the same thing. He says, hey, we stayed friends the whole time. But uh, yeah, she went uh, the other way. But man, we love some KT Austin records. I'm trying to think of the other one that she had that was a big hit. You remember what it was, Tom? Did you, did you ever listen to her stuff? I've heard her, yeah. She was very unique. She was... Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the great country singers had something more to them than, uh, you know, I think one thing that would explain it to you in the coolest way would be Ray Charles was sold, you know, so many records to country fans, but was he a country artist? No. What Ray Charles did was play country songs. Yeah, the His modern way. sound of country music. Right? Yeah, he played country songs. You know, uh, the songs that he played were were songs that other country artists had done. He interpreted their music in his soulful way, and you know what? He was embraced because it was real. I can't stop loving you. You know, uh, this is sad. I was playing. Uh, my aunt, my mother's sister was in a home. And I went out to the home just to play piano and sing songs for her and the other uh, girls, ladies, that were uh, there at the home. And I started playing I Can't Stop Loving You and my aunt, her name was Aunt Rita. She's gone. But she started crying when uh, I sang I Can't Stop Loving You and she says, I, it makes me think of Joe. Which was her husband, my Uncle Joe. And uh, as soon as I said, I can't stop loving you, she, oh my God, she started falling apart. And I just realized what I had done. But she, she was my mom's sister and, and really was a, a great aunt to, to, to all of us kids. And so was my Uncle Joe, her husband, Joe and Rita. We used to go to their house when we were a little boy, every New Year's Eve. And they would... Uh, have a New Year's Eve party, and then uh, Danny Odo would take off all his clothes and put on a diaper, and then he would come down the stairs after everybody got all drunk, <laughs> and every and at the time everybody drank whiskey and smoked cigarettes. I was just a little kid, you know, and I remember all the old people. <sighs> how cool that was! I just thought it was so great. I couldn't wait to smoke. My parents didn't smoke because they they. Uh, I think they both smoked when they were young, and when they started having children, they both quit c cigarettes and never smoked again. But that was a great, uh, great time in life. I was gonna do uh, a couple things here. Let's see what we got. Cause I'll come over there. <gasps> oh my God. This is one thing I wanted to do today. In 1995, I played a show at the Fat City on the South Side, which I don't call that Fat City. The real Fat City was here in Swissville. But that, they put this club together down the South Side, Fat City, and for the guys that were younger than us, that was their Fat City. But I was hired on the show to open up the show. Bruce Springsteen was coming in to play with the House Rockers. And they hired me to be the opening act. And I think one of the reasons, and I knew the people at the radio stations didn't like me. And they had been treating me bad for a few years. But I couldn't put my finger on it. They, they weren't, they hadn't blackballed me yet, but they were just not acknowledging my existence very often. But they hired me to be on this show. And I think the reason they hired me was because those guys could only play so many songs because it wasn't a real band, you know, and they just put this routine together and they needed somebody 
that would play a long time and somebody that wouldn't get bruised off the stage. Because when you open a show for Bruce Springsteen, while the whole time you're playing, people are going, Bruce, Bruce. And, uh, well, that didn't happen when I played. You know why? Because I showed them what I had in my shorts. You think I didn't? Because I come out guns loaded with my drummer, Whitey Cooper, and I had a bass player who had been playing bass for two weeks. That's all I needed. Chaluch, Dago boy from Jersey. Killer singer, fantastic guitar player, but he needed a job and I needed a bass player, so I taught him how to play bass to a handful of songs and we started gigging. He ended up working with for me a year, year and a half, maybe two years. But we opened a show for those guys and crushed. And I mean crushed. And if there's anyone out there in the in, in land of the internet right now that was at that show, that saw me and my guys open that show at the Fat City for uh, Bruce and the uh, House Rockers. Type in if I didn't kick everybody's ass that night. So anyway, after I played a couple, and this was, a, it was actually two nights. It was a, two nights in a row the show was. And both nights I recited a poem. And the poem that I recited is this. It's, it went like this. I said, I tip my hat to Joe and Bruce, but now it's time to turn the monkey loose. If, like, if you like what you hear, it's time to realize. Tell Pittsburgh Radio to open their eyes, because I was here when it started, and I'll die on this stage. Pittsburgh Rock and Roll, I wrote my own page. So pick up your phones and tell the powers that be, don't be afraid of a man like me, because pound for pound, round for round, even tonight, I'm the baddest man in this town. And everybody went crazy when I recited the poem, and it was received extremely well, both nights. I have tape recordings of it. And uh, I found out years later that one of the officials of the Evil Empire radio station that was there that night decided that me reciting that poem was... Uh, reason to blackball me from anything that had to do with Pittsburgh music that they controlled, which was in this time pretty much everything. So this was in 1995, which is 25 years ago, and I'm still blackballed by them. Um, and it's become to me a badge of honor um, because that's rock and roll. You know, it's not rock and roll to be, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to kiss your ass. What do I have to do? No, I'm rock and roll. I do what I do. You react to it the way you react to it. And that tells me who you are and who you are is a puss and who you are is someone who doesn't even know what rock and roll is. Because when I did what I did, I did it of my own steam. You weren't playing my music at that point. Who do you know that could have gone on that stage and kicked that other band's ass? You know who did? Me. On the steam of what's in my shorts. That's rock and roll. And for that, you blackball me? How can you be a Pittsburgh rock and roll station and not play Norman Nardini? And not only not play me, but not acknowledge that I exist. My name isn't allowed to be mentioned. And it, because if they were smart, they wouldn't have blackballed me. They would have just treated me bad. Played a song once or you know once or twice a year, mentioned my name, threw me on a show here and there, but gave me a bad billing. But they didn't do that. They wanted total domination, and they wanted to show that they controlled things, so they blackballed me totally. And that gave me the right to say the things I'm saying right now. And it also gave me the right to say that their sniveling minions, the bands that they do prop up, never stood up for me. It gave me the right to say what, what I'm going to sing right now. I wrote a song about all this shit, and I'm going to play it for you. It's a little thing called The Horse. See what you think of it. Uh, and I'd like to send it out to the liver lip troll who is a guy that uh, works at the evil empire and who told me personally 
that he blackballed me. So if you're out there listening and you think I'm making this shit up, I'm not. Ask the liver lib troll himself if he did not do this. He'll tell you. He brags about it. And hey, I give him I gotta give him respect for that. He don't deny that he did it. He thinks he did the right thing. What do you think? How's the story? I haven't played this, uh, so I'm trying all the trying all this new music today that I hadn't played and I didn't get a chance to rehearse it like I should have. But let's give her a shot. <laughs> stand together propped up by each other in this town and as I piss into the wind y'all say that I've sinned so I cry the tears of a clown and now you all can kiss my ass And if you're here in any class Someone would recall my name Something in this picture's missing I'm a man that you all been dissing Now it's your town But there ain't no denying I broke the horse you're riding Y'all say I'm too crazy Crazy enough to take a stand And in that blue and tumbleweed I planted a seed and I never got the dirt off my hands And you all been treating me like trash Up and wiped away my past In cold blood I've been shot down You guns are still smoking But my spirit ain't been broke And after all these years What's the sense of hiding that I broke the horse you're riding? Now I haunt the shadows on the desperate side of town. Blue and smoky places, all I hear is a lonesome sound. That's my sacred ground Even though I've been forsaken I've given more than taken I still swim upstream But you all just keep backsliding And I broke the horse And I said the course I broke the horse You're riding That's a nice hunk. I've never really gotten a chance to do that with the band or, uh, but boy, it's fun to play. I hope it came off okay. And you all been treating me like trash up and wiped away my past. In cold blood, I've been shot down. Wiped away my past like I don't exist. To blackball me is a personal effort. You made it personal. To treat me bad, I couldn't say, I wouldn't have the right to say the things that I'm saying today if you just treated me bad. That would have been the smartest thing to do. But when you did what you did and made it personal and wiped out my history and refused to mention my name, 
Now that gives me the right to say the shit I'm saying. You liver lip troll. Come on from behind the curtain, you prick. Admit that you done wrong. I'll give you a goddamn slap. Hey, I'm Norman. Am I glad to be here? I was uh, messing around this week. And I, uh... A lot of times when I write a song, the reason I write it, I always say this to myself. And maybe some of you other writers might think of this. I always think, if I'm standing on stage, what is something I want to be saying to the people? Uh, and here was the scenario here. Here's what I'm thinking. I'm up on stage, and somebody I know, and somebody that I think a lot of, comes into the room. And when that happens, here's what I do. And so I wrote this song. It took 10 minutes to write, if that. Uh, but some, somebody that I know comes into the room, and I look at them and blow them a kiss or whatever. And then, and then here we go. We go, for, go into this. John's jumping. Pimps and hoes, but something's missing till you show. It ain't a party till you get here when you arrive. Everybody gets turned up, the joint come alive. You make my blues disappear. It ain't a party till you. Start again. Lots of low bands playing, dressed to kill, people swaying. It ain't a party till you get here. When you arrive, everybody get turned up. The joint come alive. You make my blue disappear. It ain't a party till you get here. Over there. You look good tonight. Get over here. I'll give you a smack right on the shit can. Ha ha! Spilling out into the parking lot. Inside a joint, it's too damn hot. But then a party till you get here. When you arrive, everybody get turned up. Joint come alive. You make my blues disappear. It ain't a party till you get here. One thing that's perfectly clear. It ain't a party till you get here. Well, 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 well. It ain't a party till you get here. And that's exactly how we feel about each and every one of y'all when you tune in to Norman Nardini alone. Eight. How do you like that? We've been doing these eight times. That's a lot of weeks. That's 16 weeks. 16 weeks. Of not being around people, of not touching my peoples, my fans. I don't know if they're my fans. I don't think of them as my, I th I don't think of them as my fans. I think of them as my peoples. And I know them all. I know their faces. And they know this old face. And they'll look at me and say, Hey, Norman, he's crazy tonight. When's he going to go off? And they look for that. They're ready. They want to see it. They, they'd like to see you go off. You know what I mean? I guess that's what I've trained them and trained myself to sell the personality, the humanity of them. Because, you know, you really haven't heard my music on the radio and stuff like that. And so I've learned how to um, have significance strictly on my own steam. And that, which has been a great thing because it taught me how to man up. It taught me how to blow myself up and have the humanity that you can force inside a microphone. Just take it and you stick it all right in here. And it comes out in the sound of your voice. And it comes out 
in the words that you say and it, and it comes out in the way your body moves and that's rock and roll that's the real thing hey when they play you on the radio that doesn't mean that it's real it means they're playing it on the radio but it doesn't mean that it translated it doesn't mean that it can change your religion it has significance and it has a believability because radio tells you that there's something about it that has significance but it don't light a fire the fire is lit in human to human heart to heart soul to soul that's rock and roll you feel me now because I'll come right over there and give you a smack right on your shit can. Hey, I'm glad to be here. We are um, some crazy hunks of man meat. And we want to stick it right in your goddamn ear. I'm going to play you a number. I think you might like it. I played it on this series before. I wrote it uh, after talking to a couple buddies of mine, and uh, it's not so long ago. I'm going to get a lot and I'm going to live till I'm not Till I'm not amazed by the rain falling down Drinking of the seasons turning around Till I'm not impressed that our three rivers flow To the Mississippi, down to the Gulf of Mexico and Till I'm not gonna give all that I got out of this life. I'm gonna get a lot and I'm gonna live till I'm not. Till I'm not overwhelmed when I look to the sky, see a thousand stars. Shimmering bright Till I'm not inspired By the sound of a choir A snowy winter day The warmth of the fire And I'm gonna live Till I'm not Gonna give All that I got Out of this life I'm gonna get on it I'm gonna live Till I'm not Till I'm not able to shed a single tear Till I'm not overcome when I add up the cost Mistakes that have made, loved ones I've lost Till I'm not thankful for all that I've earned Deep in my heart, passion still burns And I'm gonna live till I'm not gonna give all that I got out of this life, I'm gonna get a lot and I'm gonna live, I'm gonna live, I'm gonna live to I'm not. Till I'm not. Over there. Cause I'll come over there. I don't know. You guys are hanging with us. There, that's better, isn't it? There we are. We need a mirror overhead so we can shoot. 
Oh, wow. It's like instructional video. I thought Tom was getting kinky on me. There you go. stage and singing was so natural and and, uh, and I know she started as a kid and was uh, born into a, a terrible scene of the, the music industry and business and she was a victim of all the insanity of the craziness of the era that she came up with but in spite of all that she was she deserved all the accolades she had because she really was better than all the competition you know, except for, you know, Billie Holiday, you know, who, who was uh, another one that was just when she opened her mouth. And, you know, I think of uh, today, I think of this, uh, the woman who, who passed on young, Amy Winehouse. Amy Winehouse. Yeah. That bitch sang her ass off. She really was better than all the other ones of her generation and her time. When she sang... She really had, she was in touch with a higher power. Her voice had so much beauty and depth to it. And it was so, it's, it sounded so easy and so natural when it came out of her. And uh, 
you know, like a Judy Garland, an Amy Winehouse, Billie Holiday, you know, um, touched by God. I, in my mind, you know, these women were all um, given this gift to uh, open up people's hearts. Another Bonnie Raitt, you know. I've been checking out this chick, Nora Jones, and I'm starting to really find and. Uh, something in her that I, and I didn't see it right away when I heard her I, I guess I'm for coming from the rock and roll world a little more bombastic and but over the years and, and, and this song and that song you know and I started hearing her sing like old country classics like you don't know me and uh, those types of songs and, and it just started breaking me down and I said you know what this Nora Jones very subtly and very ladylike and, and which is the way she presents it she took over my mind, uh, and I give her credit for that because she she did it in a uh, a very seductive way, and um, she, I didn't even realize she was she didn't come on all this and tits and ass. She just sang the words, and the sound of her voice uh, broke me down like a shotgun, <laughs> opened me up, and that ain't no bullshit. But uh, speaking of, you know, great lady singers, Bonnie Raitt, you kidding me? She starts opening her mouth up. My God in heaven. Mm. You know, my mother had a crush on her father. I don't know if you remember. John Raitt, yeah. John Raitt. Big musical. He was like a... He was a, in Oklahoma. Broadway. Broadway. He was... He was yeah. Her father was... Square as a box, handsome, talented, but square as a box. And then his his daughter, Bonnie Raitt, she comes out. She's beautiful and just bringing it, all redheaded and shit like that. Are you kidding me? Playing some slide guitar, sliding up and down, up there all slinky looking. God damn you! Think I won't come over there? I told you the other couple weeks ago about Italian foreplay. You know what uh, the definition of Italian foreplay is? Get over here! <laughs> Here's me laughing about me. Now that tells you about a guy, right? That's what guys do. They make a joke and then they laugh at their own goddamn joke. I guess it's a guy thing. Although, and although I'm not very much of a man, I do what I can with what I got. You know, the other night when my goddamn water heater blew out at 2 o'clock in the morning. And here's me. I'm sick at the time. Hadn't eaten a couple days. Hadn't slept. My face. I don't even want to. Don't look at my face. I got this goddamn water shooting all over my basement. I'm sick to my stomach. And I got to figure out where the pipes, where the water comes from, the gas. And that's when I looked at. I, 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 I'm not much of a man. I don't know man things. Men know things like this, but I must not be much of a man because I don't know what God, I don't know what to do. Five, you know, I started calling my friends and a couple of guys picked up and said some things to me and I tried to turn knobs and shit. My hands are all broken up. I couldn't get knobs. It was a nightmare. And yet, here I am today, all brand new. You know, my shoulder doesn't hurt as bad as it did. My hand doesn't hurt as bad as it did. You know what, you guys and your support of me and what I'm trying to accomplish, you lift me up. You are my life's brassiere. You take my sagging titty life and you cup my cup the breasts of my life. Push it up and squeeze them together. You know, they don't look too bad. You do that for me. I almost trip myself. You do that for me. I can't do that for me. All I can do is make offerings. I offer. And if people receive, if y'all pick up what I'm putting down, I sense it. And I feed off of it like a vulture, like a rodent. <laughs> and I get energy from it. And that's what I need. I don't need sleep like most people need sleep. They sleep every day the hell. I sleep every couple, three days. People need to eat. Me? 
it sounds weird to say, but I go to bed hungry every night. Not because I choose to, but because my guts don't work real good, and if I eat late at night, I get sick. And I tried to fight that for 10 years, and finally I just gave up, and I says, you know what? I can't eat late at night, so I go to bed hungry every night. And it's been good for me. It's worked out. And at first I thought, this is not right. This is... But now I, you know, and you know what else it does for me? It keeps me like this on the balls of my feet. Like I'm in training. Like I'm always ready for a fight. I'm always, I'm always gig ready. I don't know about you guys, but one thing that's always been important to me was to be gig ready. If I ever got that call, and by the way, my phone don't ever ring. But if I ever got that call and somebody says, hey, I need you to go out and... Like well, that story I told you about today about opening for the House Rockers with the guy from Jersey. Uh, I was gig ready. I was ready for that show. My guys were ready for that show. So I did get that call. Um, but I've all, it's always been important to me, and, and still to this day, to be gig ready. If I got the call, I could go out tomorrow, walk on any stage of any size, open it for any son of a bitch that ever strapped on a guitar, that ever tightened up their leather pants, you know, like this here. Did a little strut work. I was all ready to fist fight them in public. See what they held in their shorts. See how much they filled up them silk panties that a lot of them guys wear. Give me a, st get the hell out of here. Sons of bitches. I'll fist fight all you. Come on. You know what I do? It fox them in. I play dumb, you know. That's what I've done a lot in my life. Play dumb. Play small. And then when they get close enough, bang! Right in the gizzard. Then you hit them once and I go, that little son of a bitch, he's got some nastiness to him. And here's me smiling. Mm-hmm. That's right. They didn't warn you about me, did they? Well, I'm here to tell you. I'm a beast of a boy. <laughs> and I ain't taking no shit from no MF'er. Because girls, I come on strong and I stay on long. <laughs> How do you like that kind of talk? That'll blow your skirt up. Whew. Give you a little... There's some other things I want to talk about today. 20 minutes. One thing I wanted to talk about was smoking a joint in the Pittsburgh Penguins locker room. Tom, did we talk about that? Yes. We did. We got that spot. Another thing I wanted to talk about was telling the mayor of Erie that the wonderful pewter tray, hand tool tray that he gifted me and my friends with would be my new perfect joint rolling tray. Did we talk about that? We did. Another thing I wanted to talk about was the liver lip troll just pissing me off and castrating by cutting me out of the scene. You know what he did? He totally castrated the entire Pittsburgh music scene, cut the balls off of it. In other words, it couldn't reproduce, it couldn't multiply, it didn't go nowhere. It just went out like a... It shot a little spooge, it just went, you know, just ripped down the leg. You kidding me? Because I'll come over there. Here's one thing I did. I want to talk about light and farts. Did we talk about that? Yeah. That's good. I wanted it to get was that. Good. Did you like that part, Tom? <laughs> Tom, have you ever lit in farts? Uh, once or twice. Personally? Yes. How was your uh, concussion? Uh, Competitive? You wouldn't judge it? About average. Oh, okay. You know what I had? I had push. I'd blow them out, man. I get a foot and a half, two feet out there. Blue smoke. Little orange on the tip. <laughs> Scare the shit out of somebody in a room. My niece said she heard about it, but she had never seen anyone do it. I looked, I said, like, you kids haven't lived. I mean, are you kidding me? You don't, none of your friends ever lit farts for you? What kind of guys are you hanging out with? I don't know if girls like farts. Are there any girls... Okay, if there's any girls out there that have ever lit in a fart, please write in and tell us now so Tom would pick it up and, and let us know. But if any girls that would, any girls that are man enough to brag about lighting farts. You know, I used to know a girl. 
and I didn't know her well, but I, she was from Swissville, and she was a friend of some of my friends, and her name was Square Bidnett. And I don't know where she got that name from, but her name was Square Business. I bet she herself or one of her girlfriends had lit in a fart. That's what I'm thinking. Uh, I was going to talk about this other stuff, but I think I'll save that for another day. Um, I'm Norman Nardini, Norman Roosevelt, Aloysius, Nicodemus, Amadeus, Valentino, oh, I just farted, I should have lit it, <laughs> where's, <laughs> Tom, where's my leg? <laughs> Shut up! All right, <laughs> I just I just blew one out. You know, you ever you know it's how sometimes they just come and you can't even you didn't know they were coming. It says, "Whew." Okay, start again. Norman Roosevelt, Aloysius, Nicodemus, Amadeus, Valentino, Giovanni, Romeo, Bruno, Raphael. Lucien Alawigi Nardini, the beast of the East, the uncrowned king of Pittsburgh rock and roll, Little Big Mouth, the manful handful, the willing villain. I got that one from my friend Robbo Frill from um, the YP Blue Show. He, he hit me with the willing villain. I says, you know what? You're all right, you little prick. Uh, you can download my music, our music, by whole LPs or single tracks, and you get a whole LP for under $10 uh, on Amazon or iTunes. Amazon or iTunes. And the albums that are available are Notorious, Bonafide, Redemption, It's Alive, Breakdown in Paradise, and This Old Train. The one thing I wanted to talk about, somebody asked me about... Uh, Recording stuff and, and uh, back in the day. And I wanted to talk about the recording of the Dirty Diamonds record. Because it, it's kind of like a historic record. It's a record that uh, a lot of Euros think very highly of. Especially a lot of Euros that are really into uh, hard music. You know, like uh, heavy stuff. Like hard rock, when, you know, like early Aerosmith and, and those kind of bands. And the Diamonds was around at that period of time. And um, when we cut that record, we had just gotten thrown off Atlantic. And uh, our managers were uh, realizing that we were maniacs and that they were, if not already, had they run for cover. They were getting ready to run from cover from us because we were, what's the word might be used, would might have called us unmanageable. Um, I think they have a rinse that you put on your hair if your hair is unmanageable, but if you have a band that's unmanageable, I don't know what the hell you do. You're shit out of luck. But anyway, we wanted to do this record, and we were, and we had been playing dates with um, that weirdo from Michigan, Ted Nugent, and. Uh, Uh, a mess of other acts, harder acts from that time. And we had built this unique hard music together that was more musical than a lot of the other hard bands. We thought it was anyway. And so we got uh, picked up by Buddha Records, which ended up years later when I put out my um, Eatin' Alive record was for the same label, but unrelated... Uh, business you know they, they i don't even know if they realized i was the bass player for the diamonds when i did my norman nardini solo record with them but anyway uh we put all this music together and we and it was me mckeg had left the band because he realized how crazy we were and mckeg was was and is 
a straight up, very good, common sense, great musician, great guy. We were nutbags, to say the least. So he got out while the getting was good. But the music we were making was unique. And so what happened is Buddha hooked us up with this producer who was producer. I later I found out by working with him, he was more of an engineer than a producer. And at the time I was becoming a producer because I had been working at the studio and um, doing all these hour after hour after hour sessions of novelty shit to rock and roll shit to building this rock music that we were making. And the producer had done Aerosmith's first record. They had that song, uh, Dream On. Dream On! Good record. And uh, that album, and his name was Adrian Barber. He was an English guy. And he was also a friend of the Beatles. Uh, which led to a story of the production of the record. He wanted us to do the song, Helter Skelter. And I didn't want nothing to do with that. I thought, we have all this music that we're writing, and we're a band, what the hell do we want to do a Beatles song for? That ain't, that ain't what we want to do. But, and I was kind of like the leader of the band, but not officially. I didn't have the clout. The, the, you know, the stars of the band were the leaders of the band. Frank and Warren were the go-to guys, and I was transitioning from, in my position and doing things at that time. So I lost the battle when we ended up having to do uh, Helder Skelter and, they ended, I, and then I fought to get it not put on the album and they, I lost that battle as well. But anyway, what are you going to do? But we cut the rhythm tracks at Jerry Studios up in uh, Rochester, which is by Fever Balls. Did you ever get Fever Balls, Tom? Not lately. <laughs> good, good answer. Not lately. In other words... Maybe 30, 40 years ago, he had to get a shot of penicillin right in his shit can, right? <laughs> That's how that works out. But we cut the, tra the rhythm tracks at Jerry's studio. And uh, they had, Jerry's, the studio was a soft room and it was designed like the old studios in Nashville with, uh, and like old big houses and where everything was carpeted and they tried to go for a dead sound and you got that Nashville sound that at one time was thought of as professional but as music was transitioning we all realized that cutting in dead rooms and carpets were things that weren't good for recordings. So Jerry had built this room that was the size of like maybe two closets and it was a hard room with a hardwood floor. So we cut our drums in there so that we got a pretty good sound. And uh, we cut the rhythm tracks at Jerry's in Rochester. And I remember we were getting all effed up at the time. We were goofballs. And I remember one time Robbie Johns, uh, oh, I just farted again. Uh, I remember one time Robbie Johns getting all effed up and throwing up uh, right outside the control room. And, and I just thought how rock and roll that was. I was like, I nothing to be ashamed of. I said, that's what, guys, that's what bands do. They throw up at sessions. You cut some music, you maybe throw up, and then you get back in there. And then, after that, we went up to New York City to do the overdubs and to mix it. And we went to the Hit Factory, <clears throat> which was the studio that John Lennon hung, at, hung out at. And where his guys hung out at, like Klaus Vormann and uh, these cats that he had hung with. And uh, I think John Lennon was out of town at the time because this guy, Adrian Barber, who I didn't get along with, the producer, me and him started fighting right away when we were cutting the rhythm tracks because he wanted to be the producer and he was hired to be the producer, so I got to give him that. But I didn't think he, he, since he came from the engineering side of the business, when he started making musical decisions, I didn't feel that they were the right decisions. So I would say to him, what I thought. And he didn't like the idea of a musician having knowledge and having the ability to administrate the knowledge that he was putting out there. So he and I didn't get along the whole time, but whatever, no big deal. But we went up to New York City and we're, and we're, we're at the Hit Factory and, uh, and the one cool thing about being up there was John Lennon's side chick 
kept coming to the studio to hang out with us. Uh, her name was Mei Pang. She was a Japanese girl. She had a couple girlfriends, and they would come to the studio and just sit and watch us cut and stuff and, and just, you know, hang out and socialize. It was cool. And uh, it was very empowering to work at a studio like that and uh, and realize that we had come from a, a shithole studio in East Liberty that uh, no one ever talks about and remembers but me. I mean, I, I still talk about the things that happened there because it, to me it was important because it started, jump-started me into a career. Uh, but I don't hear other people speak of it as, as part of Pittsburgh rock history, which I believe it really was. Uh, but that album that we cut, you know, we went up there and, and uh, Frank and uh, really shined, Frank Zori was our singer, and he really shined when he was cutting his vocals at this hit factory in New York City. And we did some guitar solos up there, I believe. And Warren King stood out. And uh, the rhythm tracks that me and Robbie Johns had put together showed up well. And, and all the folks had a certain amount of respect for what we were doing. And, and we really hadn't uh, made any kind of a name for ourselves in the business. But it was nice to see that by the merits of our work, we were... Uh, not bum rushed out of time, which a lot of guys might have been had they not had it in their pants to stand up and be somebody. You see what I'm saying? But uh, and that record, it came out and it really didn't get much airplay anywhere or get much acknowledgement anywhere. But years later, um, I forget the guy's name, an English guy that an English writer of significance. He wrote for a magazine called Kerrang! And he put a, a, together a uh, a hard rock label called Rock Candy Records, I guess about eight, ten years ago. And he, he said that he thought that that record was one of the top five uh, undiscovered hard rock records of all time. And really, uh, and he came and he put it out again. He reissued it and uh, ga gave it an, a, a new s slap on the ass and a kick into life, you know, kicked it back in the lane. And uh, it was nice to see that happen, the work we did so young that really was not received with open arms anywhere we were hanging. It was just kind of like, well, they did this. And uh, we thought it had significance. And we knew that when we went on stage and played that music with other bands, we, we knew that we could take over an audience of that era with that music and that band. And that was important to us because that was all, we never had that business support where there's all these people propping, it, propping you up, telling you, telling people, these are the guys, this music is the important music, these are the guys that can make get it done. We didn't have that. All we had was dragging our asses out on the stage and if we were great, we were great. If we won that audience, we won that audience on the strength of the balls in our trousers. You hear me? On our trousers. And that's how we grew up. And that's how I still am. Because that's all I've ever had is me bringing it to the people. And if what I do has meaning and has significance... It's because I worked it and I developed it on my own steam and I never really have been a part of the business or the people that uh, have forced others into the limelight and have helped others uh, obtain big success. But here we are. Norman Nardini alone eight. We're probably running out of time. Three minutes. How long, Tom? Three minutes. We have three minutes. Yes. We have we three can minutes. do a really quick song. We can always run over. <laughs> we have three minutes to love. You know, there was a time when I'd give you a good three minutes. And that time turned into five minutes. And then as I gained a little more experience, the time turned into ten minutes. And then that time turned into... Get over here! 
and it turned into, you know, we're going to see the sun come up. It turned into two and three hours athletic events, and that's what I'm talking about. That's what a man does. It's called performance. Bada boom! I don't know if I ever told you the time I went to the whorehouse when I was 16 years old and I paid my five dollars and at the end of my 20 seconds the whores in that whorehouse coined a phrase that to this day lives on and I don't know if you know what that is my performance was so unique and so short-lived and so quick that they created a term for what I did that day, that in whorehouses all around the world, they all use the same phrase to describe it. You know what they called it? The one pump dump. <laughs> now get out of here. <laughs> Are you still laughing at that one? I hope so. <laughs> Doing. Norman Nardini alone, eight. Oh, get down to the get down. Everybody gonna be there when we get down to the get down. Bring your style and flair. See you around at the get down when we get down to the get down everybody gonna lose their blues when we get down to the get down bring your dancing dancing shoes gonna get unwound at the get down This is the time we blow kisses. Don't look at the bags under my eyes. You know, as soon as I leave here tonight, I'm gonna get out my preparation H and get these bags under my eyes and that'll suck them up and before you know it. Oh look, I had some surgery done. <laughs> like them bitches on them housewife show. Mike, get it up. I'll give you sons of bitches. How you doing? We good?